Welcome to The Baton, a John Williams musical journey. Join host Jeff Cummings as he takes you through the career of the illustrious film composer John Williams, starting with his debut in 1959 through more than 100 films in 60 years. Today's episode features the 1978 film Jaws 2. Now here's your host, Jeff Cummings. When Universal Pictures made money hand over fist with Jaws in 1975, it was a no-brainer that the studio would want another blockbuster that will scare people out of the water and make even more money. Even without a script, director, or actors lined up for another visit to Amity Island, Universal still gave the go-ahead to Jaws 2 in 1975. It would take another three years until the movie would make its debut in theaters. Pretty much everyone returned for Jaws 2, except for the person that really mattered, Steven Spielberg. Now here's a quote from Spielberg in October 1975 regarding his decision to turn down the job of directing the sequel. Quote, Making a sequel to anything is just a cheap carny trick. End quote. So let's take a moment to ponder that statement, especially given that he would seemingly forget that in 1977 when he briefly considered taking on Jaws 2, but work on Close Encounters of the Third Kind had him tied up longer than everyone could wait. And he would completely throw away his notion about sequels when he agreed to direct all of the follow-ups to Raiders of the Lost Ark, as well as the first sequel to Jurassic Park. I will say this though, Spielberg for the most part does make films that have a very finite ending, with no possibility for a sequel. Although I think it's time for him to think about bringing Roy back from his interplanetary voyage and do a sequel to Close Encounters of the Third Kind, don't you think? Dick Zanuck and David Brown returned to produce, with Carl Gottlieb writing an original script based on the characters he created in his original novel. Interestingly, the cinematographer on Jaws 2, Michael Butler, is in no way related to Bill Butler, who was the cinematographer on the original Jaws. And that's a pretty amazing coincidence. In front of the camera, Richard Dreyfuss was the only top-name star who elected not to return to Amity Island. Dreyfuss said many years later that he turned down Jaws 2 because Spielberg also turned it down. And if he hadn't turned it down, the film would have had an Oscar winner in its cast and possibly drummed up more business. Dreyfuss won the lead actor Oscar for The Goodbye Girl just three months before Jaws 2 was released. Roy Scheider came back only because he was tied down with his contract with Universal, and this seemed like a good way to fulfill the contract and move on to other things. You can see in Scheider's face that he's not fully invested in the film, but he does pretty well given that he's doing the same shtick again. He knows a shark is killing people, no one believes him until it's too late, and then he has to be the one to kill it. One of the most exciting new characters in the film is a real estate developer named Lynn Peterson, played by Joseph Mascolo. For most people, this actor is inconsequential, but for me, he's more than that. Mascolo's claim to fame, besides his villainous performance in Jaws 2, is playing Stefano Demira in Days of Our Lives for more than 30 years. Stefano Demira was the key villain in Days of Our Lives when I watched it religiously in my teens and 20s, and for many years, I even thought Mascolo was really, really Italian, based on his somewhat believable Italian accent for Demira. It was only when I caught Jaws 2 on TV the first time around 2010 that I knew Mascolo was actually American. John D. Hancock was picked to direct Jaws 2, but he didn't last long. He was fired a month into shooting the movie because he envisioned a darker movie than originally intended and because he wasn't comfortable with filming an action movie. Frenchman Jeannot Schwark took Hancock's place, and he faced the same problems that Spielberg had on the original film. The weather never truly cooperated on Martha's Vineyard, and of course, the mechanical sharks were not ideal. Filming moved to Florida for all of the scenes on the water. Now, three things really stand out in Jaws 2. First, we see the shark within the first five minutes of the film. And I suppose keeping it out of our view for half the movie, as Spielberg did in 1975's version, would not have been effective. 
But I do give the filmmakers credit for the scene in which the shark's face is partially burned in a boat fire. In my mind, this is what makes the shark so menacing in the sequel. He's not happy about being hurt, and his desire to kill has been kicked up a notch after that incident. Yes, I believe this, even despite a quote in the movie that says, quote, sharks don't take things personally. In Jaws 2, the shark feels more like a serial killer than just an eating machine. Another major aspect of Jaws 2 is the increased death toll. I didn't take an accurate tally, but I think more than 10 people died in the film, as opposed to just 4 in the original. The deaths are mostly done off camera or below the water. You never see the after effects of the deaths other than some blood in the water, unlike in the previous movie where you saw a severed leg. The other thing that stands out in this movie is the music. I had never seen Jaws 2 all the way through until watching it in one sitting for this episode. I noticed just three true moments of John Williams bringing back the famous shark theme. Other than that, it's your typical action-adventure music. I am sure Williams knew from the beginning that he wasn't going to simply do a reprise of the music from the first film, and it took me about 45 minutes of film time to adjust to that. But once I did, I appreciated the approach. And when Williams takes away the main theme of an iconic score, all he could do is start with a fresh slate. But there seems to be a bigger reason why Williams didn't write his famous theme into the score. Production was taking longer than usual, and Universal Studios was not backing down from its June 1978 release date. Williams was under a deadline as well. He had to get the score to Jaws 2 done before he headed to London to do work on Superman. So he couldn't wait for the usual first cut of the film to spot key scenes. He composed music based on the screenplay and a few scenes that Swark cobbled together for him. This would be why there aren't a lot of sync points in the score, which was one of the hallmarks of the original score. Williams had done this a few times before, but never to this degree. To his credit, the score has some really good moments, but they mostly happen in the non-action scenes. The movie's focus stays on the teenagers on Amity Island, including Chief Brody's eldest son, Michael. In an attempt to not give every plot point away, I won't tell you what happens to Brody's kids in the movie, but this time, it's personal. Wait a minute, didn't they use that line for Jaws 4? So when the film starts, John Williams teases you on the first note that he might give us his famous theme. There's a low rumble in the basses before the harp comes in, but we don't get the shark theme. The harp will be a constant presence in the water scenes, one of the holdovers from the 1975 score when Williams used the harp to signify underwater action. This undulating theme in the harp during the opening is taken over by the strings, then the brass, when the title Jaws 2 appears on the screen. In less than a minute, William shows us here how a theme can change from innocent to terrifying with the right instrumentation change. The undulating harp comes back for a while as we see scuba divers at the bottom of the sea. Our first musical reprise from the first film comes when the divers encounter the orca ship that sank at the end of the 1975 film. Strings and horns play the theme.
And then we get what we really wanted to hear. The music during the shark attack is a bit frenzied, like the editing that matches the scene. I didn't feel as scared as I did when Chrissy was attacked at the beginning of the first film, and I think it has to do with the tone of the music. This is the way Williams will approach pretty much every attack scene, keeping in line with his promise to make a totally different score. One of the big attack moments in the film comes when a water skier is taken down by the shark. And of all the deaths in this movie, this is the one that cannot be taken out of the movie because it's very crucial to what happens later. The music is dominated by a furious pace on various instruments as the shark chases down the skier. But if you listen closely, you'll hear the shark theme at varying speeds on strings and horns near the beginning of this cue. And then we get to the moment when the shark takes a bite out of the ski and brings the girl into his waiting jaws. But there's more to the scene. The driver of the boat sees that her friend is missing and goes back to investigate. She sees the chewed up ski, but doesn't see the shark that is about to ram into her boat. The music you'll hear accompanies her attempt to kill the shark by dousing it with gasoline and shooting it with the flare gun. But she gets gas on herself, the boat catches fire, and then explodes. Thank <laughs> you. 
You heard the shark theme played a little bit higher on the strings than normal. And again, this is going with Williams' plan to give this shark a different kind of identity. The new material that Williams composed for the film was not really a theme per se, but really a mood to fit the teenagers who are at the heart of the film. They like to take their boats out on the water, and Williams wrote very sprite and innocent music for them, which fits its introduction as the kids throw water balloons at each other. Later, to set up the finale, all the kids, including both of Brody's children, set out in their boats to head to the other side of the island to a secluded lighthouse. I like this music composed for the shots of the boats leaving the docks. It's bold and still a bit innocent. And this is when the tension cranks up. This shark really goes into serial killer mode in the final 30 minutes of the movie. When one of the kids stops his sailboat to make out with his girlfriend, the shark targets the boat. I think this is one of the action scenes Williams was able to watch early because there are many sync points that he works with here. Things stay quiet until the shark makes his move on poor Eddie, who is definitely not going to make it back to the boat in time. Notice the strong harp performance here, similar to the shark cage attack in the first film.
Eddie will now be carried by the shark at high speed to the boat, where the brass instruments will play the shark theme until Eddie hits the boat and later goes under for good. That's really good music, and probably my favorite death in the film. But all the screaming and splashing drowned out some of the best parts of the music in the film, including the performance of the shark theme at the end on the trumpets. The shark really turns on the kids after Eddie's death, wrecking their boat so much that they can only hope the tide gets them back to dry land. Luckily, a helicopter comes in to try and rescue the kids by towing their disabled boats to safety but our shark takes a bite out of the helicopter before it takes off and sinks it. But the shark isn't done. He takes another run at the boats, scaring the kids. But no one goes in the water this time. And once the shark goes under, Williams writes a sustained 20-second note for the strings as we wait to see if the shark will return. The shark does return and takes Brody's youngest son, Sean, into the water. The girl who gets Sean to safety, unfortunately, doesn't make it. The finale didn't really have me on the edge of my seat as Spielberg, Williams, and Scheider did in the 1975 film. It is a little more gory, but musically, it didn't create the same rising tension that it needed.
I think it's the lack of thematic material that keeps it from being a thrilling conclusion to the film. Barely even a hint of the shark theme as he goes in for his final kill. Now, though this wasn't the type of sequel that outshone the original, Jaws 2 still made a big profit, earning more than $100 million in its initial theatrical run. And that made Universal Studios hungry for more, releasing two more Jaws movies over the years that became even more ridiculous. I'm happy John Williams wasn't pressured to return for work on the future sequels, which came when he was too busy to handle the scoring duties on them anyway. We shouldn't count Jaws 2 as Williams selling out to make some money on what was going to be profitable no matter what. I think any composer would love to return to a musical canvas that had some resonance. And as I said before, we should praise Williams for not rehashing the music from the 1975 film. After Williams completed his music for Jaws 2, he didn't have much time to sit and relax and decompress. He had to take a plane over to London to get started on work on six months of recording for Superman, which would come out later that year. And that movie is going to be the focus of the next episode. It also happens to be the 50th episode of The Baton. And I hope you will all join me to celebrate not only the great music for The Man of Steel, but also to celebrate this milestone in this podcast. Thanks everybody for taking this journey with me through the film and score to Jaws 2. And as always, if you have comments, please feel free to post them on the Podbean app or send me an email to jeffswim at aol.com. Until next time, the baton is down.